Hello and welcome back to the Crash Course Guide for Population Perspective. Today is part two, which means we're going to be looking at births and deaths, Bradford Hill criteria, Maxwell criteria and health inequalities, including the Tanner Hill model and the clinical iceberg concept. So let's start with births and deaths. Let's start with some basic concepts which you need, you need to understand in order to be able to use the equations in this topic. So, females of childbearing age we usually consider are between 15 and 44 years old. An infant is anything that is less than a year after live birth. An early neonatal is anything between birth and one week. A late neonatal is between one week and a month. And a post-neonatal baby is between one month and one year. So birth rates then. The first rate you need to be aware of is the crude birth rate. And this is the most common measure of fertility. However, it doesn't take into account um, that only women of childbearing age are fertile. So this is the number of life births to a residence um, in a specific area and calendar year over the average or mid-year population for the same area and year. So essentially you're looking at live births over population times a thousand. For general fertility rate, this is more specific, however, and it takes into account that only those women that are of childbearing age can give birth. So it's the number of life births divided by the population of childbearing age women in that area times a thousand. Another rate to be aware of is total period fertility rate. Now this is the average number of children born to a woman over her lifetime if she experienced the exact current age-specific fertility rates through her lifetime, i.e. she was able to give birth between the ages of 15 and 44, and she were to survive for all her reproductive years, so from 15 to 44. The perinatal mortality rate is an important health status indicator because it demonstrates the number of late, fetal and early infant deaths which are considered to be preventable. So fetal deaths um, we consider as being anything 24 weeks um, plus gestation. So the postnatal deaths are within one week. So that's why I said in understanding those definitions at the start is really important. And we divide that by all the fetal deaths and live births. And overall we times that by a thousand. So the birth rates continued, so infant mortality rate, this is another good indicator of health status and it's much easier to record the numbers of. So we do infant deaths divided by live births times a thousand. And the post neonatal mortality rate of a number of infant deaths between a month and a year of age in a given year divided by a thousand. One other rate to be aware of is the case fatality rate. So this isn't particularly applied to births, um, but it's the number of deaths from a disease divided by the number of diagnosed cases of that disease. It produces a percentage of people that die from a specific disease and it allows people to um, examine whether actually a disease is causing a lot of death once people are diagnosed with it or whether it's not causing so much death. In terms of registration, it's really important, particularly with birth, notification and registration and understanding the difference between notification and registration. And with regards to this, notification is done by the doctor or the midwife within 36 hours of the birth and registration is done by the parents within 42 days of the birth. An interesting fact to be aware of is that actually before 2003, if your parents were unmarried, then the father has no parental responsibility, even if he's named on the birth certificate. Differences in information on the um, notification and registration. So the notification it covers all of these things here, and registration covers these things here. Now, it's not expecting you to learn all of these. However, it's good to be aware of the differences between the notification and registration process and what each aspect has to record. So, for example, the notification is all about gestational age, delivery location, uh, ethnic category, still birth indicator, etc. Whereas the registration refers to the mother's maiden name, the occupation of the father, and so onwards. A communicable disease are certain infection diseases that have to be reported by law under the Public Health Act. And they're usually reported to the consultant in communicable disease control, um, which is every hospital will have one, essentially. And their role is to identify the source of infection and prevent further dissemination of that infection. Some of the diseases included are mumps, rubella, rabies, yellow fever and typhus, but there are actually a long list of communicable diseases that all must be reported if someone presents to any hospital with them. The death certificate, equally important as birth registration. So when a person dies, a medical certificate stating the cause of death is issued, and this is issued by a hospital doctor, a GP, or a coroner. 
and the death certificate includes all of these things here but pay note to the picture at the bottom here so it tells you the immediate cause of death and then you can add a secondary or tertiary cause of death which has also contributed to this actual immediate cause. The Bradford Hill criteria is a concept to be explored so these are nine criteria uh, which were created in order to allow a causal relationship between a presumed cause and an observed effect to be measured. Causality remember is the connection of one process so the cause with another process or state so the effect and where the first is partly responsible for the second and the second is partly dis dependent on the first essentially. So you want your cause to be responsible for your effect and your effect to be dependent on the cause. So for example lung cancer and smoking. These are the nine Bradford Hill criteria but let's explore them in a little bit more detail. Well first of all you've got temporality. So does the cause come before the event? If the cause is coming after the event well it's not really causing it is it? But if strength, what's the strength of association? And this goes back to the association um, graphs that we looked at at the start and the correlation coefficients. Is it plausible and is it coherent? Is it um, consistent with the existing knowledge that we have on the subject? Is it consistent? Have similar results been shown by other studies? Is it dose response correct? So for example, do if we increase the exposure, if we increase the risk, does that increase the effect that follows? Is it reversible? If we remove the cause, does the effect go away as well? The study design, is it a robust study design? Evidence, is there supportive research based on the experiment? And specificity, one cause gives one effect. Is there anything else that could cause the effect, for example, is it, or is it just that one cause? Next, look at Maxwell criteria. So these are the six dimensions of quality that can be applied to healthcare. And a lot of people like to think of these as the three A's and three E's. So the three A's are appropriate. So is the service relevant to the needs of the population that it's serving? Is it accessible? So can service users access the service? Is it easy to do? Are there appointments at available times? Is it acceptable? So how is the service viewed? Then the three E's, so equity. Is it fair? Are people treated in accordance with their needs? And be aware that this isn't equality. It's not treating everyone the same. It's treating people in accordance with their needs. Is it effective? Does it work? And lastly, is it efficient? Is it cost effective? While we're thinking about Maxwell, let's have a look at leadership because there are levels of leadership as well and reasons why we follow a leader. So why do we follow a head teacher at a high school, for example? Why do you follow your boss at a job? Is it because of their position? So they have rights. People follow because of their position. Is it due to permission? So through relationships. So people follow because they actually want to follow a leader. Is it through production? Do they follow because the leader has accomplished something that they're um, impressed by? Is it due to people development? So do people follow because of what the leader's done for them individually? Is it a pinnacle? So is it out of respect that they follow? Next, we look at health inequalities. So health inequality can be measured by the index of multiple deprivation, which is something that the UK used to have a qualitative measure of level of deprivation of geographical locations. And it's got seven weighted domains from income, employment, education, crime, health. Um, so health is obviously the one we want to focus on. Ecological fallacy ties in very closely with the index of multiple deprivation because ecological fallacy is the inference about the nature of individuals from the group to which they belong. So for example, assuming that someone who's in a geographical area um, is the same as everyone else in that geographical area. An example nicely demonstrated here is for example, falsely assuming that everyone in a class has a very high IQ just because the overall class average is high. But in actual fact, there might be some people with very high IQs and some people with very low. Moving on with health inequalities, how do we solve them? Well, we have this Tannehill model, which focuses on three aspects of health inequality. So health protection, health education, and disease prevention. So health protection looks at the fiscal and legal policies to protect our health. Health education is enhancing those positive health by changing the beliefs, attitudes and behaviours of the service users. And disease prevention can be primary, secondary or tertiary. Let's take a closer look at disease prevention then. So it can be primary, secondary or tertiary, we've said. Well, primary aims to stop the disease starting. So for example, mass vaccination. A secondary disease prevention 
aims to catch the disease early and prevent the progression of the disease, for example, screening of an at-risk population. And a tertiary disease prevention is prevention of disability becoming a handicap by reducing the impacts of long-term conditions. So bearing that in mind about tertiary prevention, consider these three terms. So what's an impairment? It's a loss or abnormality of psychological, physiological and anatomical structure or function. So pay close attention to the examples of these to be able to link them to their words. So a man develops cloudy vision as a result of inoperable cataracts. That's an impairment. When does it become a disability? Well, it's when he's restricted of a lack of ability to perform an activity in a manner within a range that we'd consider normal. So, for example, he's having difficulty to read and use his computer at work. When does it become a handicap? So this is a disadvantage for a given individual that limits or prevents the fulfilment of a role that's normal for that individual. So therefore, this man has to register himself as partially sighted and therefore is unable to continue working in the office. Nextly, the clinical iceberg. So this is a phenomenon that illustrates those who present to health services and those that aren't presenting. So the tip of the iceberg represents the diagnosed diseases, those that have presented to health services and have been diagnosed. Next you have those that have been undiagnosed or incorrectly diagnosed, but nevertheless they're still suffering from disease, so therefore these represent the unmet need. Then you have risk factors for disease, those that are exposed to risk factors that are likely to cause disease but aren't yet suffering. And then at the bottom you have those who are free from risk factors and actually healthy individuals. Let's focus in a little bit more on those that are undiagnosed or wrongly diagnosed. So we can define these as having unmet need. And needs are a really interesting prospect because they need help from a healthcare system, but they fall below the waterline and therefore aren't recognised by clinicians. So while we say needs an interesting concept, we're going to consider this next time by looking at both Bradshaw's taxonomy of need and Maslow's hierarchy of need and what the different types of need are. So, interesting concept to think about before you have a look at that video are if someone demands something, do they really need it? But equally, if someone says nothing at all, does that mean that they don't need something? That's everything for this video. Join us next time. We'll take a look at need. We're going to have a look a little bit more at study design, so in terms of sensitivity and specificity. We're also going to have a look at Wilson and Younger in terms of criteria for screening programs. And we'll also take a look at bias and confounding and summarise all the equations that are essential for first and second year population perspective.